ravine possibly, uh, or perhaps the, uh, the other side of the screen, because he describes looking out over the valley there, and they were the two best lookouts at the time, 1827, so um, he, he kind of looked out and basically was talking, he was looking for settlement for land, and I guess, you know, for the local people it didn't really uh, augur very well, but um, I guess climbing, climbing really in, in Queensland uh, probably started around the late 1800s, 1890s. Local farmers and local people started uh, wandering up the peaks. And interestingly, there were um, significant numbers of women who were doing it then too. We don't hear a lot about, but um, uh, there was an article published in one of the local papers in, I think it was in uh, about uh, nine, the early 1900s. Um, uh, someone who climbed Wilson's Peak found the names of, I think there were seven women who just climbed uh, the peak within the last week that these people had gone up there and it was and they were often local families there's one local family in in Boona for example there are uh, nine sisters uh, and nine women in the family and all of them were out climbing Mount Barney in 19, 1912, 1915 um, they watched uh, they saw Halley's Comet in 1910 from the summit of Wilson's Peak so all these kind of stories have, have come to me since I actually published my book in 2015 and, they're going to be in a revised version, which will be an e-book, um, probably coming out in a couple of months. But wow. um, uh, so lots and lots of stories uh, around there. But this this particular place has a, a, a very important meaning, I think, for for me in many ways. In that, uh, on the it was the eighth of November, 1968. Uh, Rick White and my brother Chris, um, we got into climbing with Greg. Greg Shears here too today. Uh, the infamous Greg Sheard um, survived all the falls, all of the broken backs and <coughs> bones and things, but uh, he's still walking, so that's good. Um, but uh, in 1968, by that time, we, we got into the Brisbane Rock Climbing Club, which started in 1965, so we joined it, I think it was in 67, 68, around there, a couple of years after it had started, and we didn't think you know, we could climb, so... Uh, we had to go and do some climbs, and then we'd done some climbs, and then we said, oh, we can join the club now, we can climb. But uh, um, uh, in, in those early days, we, we, you know, the gear was pretty minimalist. We had, uh, uh, we were actually climbing with an Italian hemp rope when I first started. Um, really smelt very nice, this, this hemp <laughs> rope. And, uh, it was uh, really a uh, very, very nice rope to climb with, but you know, obviously nowhere near as good as the nylon ropes that came shortly after laid nylon and then nowadays of course it's all kern mantle so uh, um, in those early early times we didn't have any cams or pitons uh, uh, you know, cams or um, uh, chocks you know we started off with pitons basically that was how we inherited uh, the climbing knowledge from someone and most people may not even know what a piton is which is great because they do a lot of damage and you whack them in and take them out again so it was, it was, it was good to see the end of those but um, um, so the gear we had then was, was quite um, minimalist, but just before Frog Buttress was discovered by uh, Rick White and my brother Chris um, on the 8th of November 1968, um, it was uh, uh, into in, in climbing in Queensland. We'd, we'd been very uh, influenced by the Chenard, Yvonne Chenard in the Great Pacific Ironworks in, in California, developed this whole swag of of um, clean climbing gear, chocks mostly. Um, he, he produced a lot of pitons in those early days, but most of the, the stuff that we were interested in were, were, were chocks, just aluminium hex, hexes. And we started, in, Rick actually started importing those. He set up his own climbing business, um, started importing those into Brisbane and then distributed them around Australia, became the uh, Australian representative for Chouinard. And, and, we, and, and initially, the that gear we thought, well, it's not that much, it um, uh, doesn't help us very much in, in the glass houses, although as the years went on and the gear got better and better, it's actually better protected there now than it ever was when you're climbing, doing the trad routes. Um, so with, um, by the time Frog Buttress arrived, we were using uh, hexagonals. It was just uh, stuff that uh, Rick was uh, making himself, actually. He'd just get a hexagonal extrusion of uh, aluminium and just cut it off at an angle, grind, put it on a grinder, drill a few holes through it to lighten it, put some tape through it and that was it. So that was uh, what they were using until the more sophisticated hollowed out uh, gear arrived from uh, Chenard. So 
weighed a ton and uh, <laughs> it, it worked. It worked in the cracks. But um, it was so the, back, getting back to the 8th of uh, November 1968, um, Rick and Chris, had, it was a day probably very much like today. There was a bit of rain around. I was studying for exams and I, I decided not to go climbing with them that day. They went down to Glenny's pulpit to do some climbs. They, um, it was too wet, so they, they were heading back to Brisbane along the Cunningham Highway, just over the, uh, over the, the hill there. And for years, several years, we've been driving on the way to Glenny's. We looked up and we'd seen the cliff line on Mount French. And from the road, it looked as though it was only about maybe um, you know five or six metres high. It was kind of hidden by an intervening hill. So. We thought, oh, one of these days, you must go and check that out. Maybe it's a good bouldering area, you know. Might find one or two roofs there, but it, it just wasn't interesting because it didn't look very high and um, didn't look very interesting at all. And that particular day, uh, Chris and Rick decided that they would try to drive up and have a look at it. And they actually came up from the highway. They, they saw that they said, oh, they saw the cliff and they said, well, let's see if we can get to it. They started following dirt roads and ended up in farmers' properties and you know, got out and got directions from farmers and directed them up past them. So they, Chris said they had to drive through a pig pen at one point. And, you know, the road that uh, Rick had a Morris 1100, which uh, some of you would know, front wheel drive, you know, terribly inappropriate car for a dirt road. And uh, Rick, of course, uh, in those days, used to flog his cars like him. And he just, he, he wrecked so many cars uh, getting to climbing areas in those days. He'd, he'd always buy sort of a second hand one, of course. And, he wouldn't care about it, but um, anyway, they made their way up, and it took them it took them just to, uh, several hours to find their way up, and they came up uh, to Frog Buttress, where the road does the the big um, uh, the big sharp bend just down in the saddle there. They came up from the western side there. There was this goat track. I, it's probably remnants are probably still there, but it's just so horrible. It was uh, steep, lots of loose boulders. So the uh, I remember Chris sort of saying, "And here these rocks just." smashy up against the, the underneath the car as Rick sort of gunned it up these hills and <laughs> was jumping around and almost tore the muffler off and um, they got up here and uh, the road all the way up through here was just rock uh, so very very rough um, and uh, they got to the top uh, wandered over still didn't know where the cliff was and and they um, they f eventually found the scree wandered down the scree and and then saw these, you know, towering columns everywhere, and thought, "Oh, it's a bit bigger than we thought." Um, and walked along uh, both sides of the cliff. And uh, I remember Chris coming home and saying, oh, "They found this. Uh, finally got to this area. Found this area." But he said, "Oh, you know, Rick um, uh, said, oh, there'd be a lot of aid climbs there. It's, 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 you know, it's, it's too steep to climb. It. You can't really climb. We were used to climbing in the glass houses where it's off the vertical or Binnaburra, which has a lot of." Um, gas-filled uh, rhyolite, so lots of little bubbly holes everywhere. But this, I looked up and said, you can't climb this. This is just, you know, aid routes. And that's what they thought. They said, it's just aid routes. And they looked, they walked along, and, and I think um, they stopped somewhere and said, oh, maybe you could get up this bit here. And, you know, it was too late by then to climb. So uh, I remember Chris coming back and sort of raving about it. But um, he was talking about the geological formation rather than the actual climbing possibilities because we were both into geology like Greg too. We, um, you know, in the early days we sort of uh, had ideas of you know, being geologists but that sort of fell by the wayside but um, we still had that interest in rocks so we were interested in it from a geological perspective. Um, interesting, interesting rhyolite and uh, anyway the next weekend um, I'm still studying for exams fruitlessly as it turned out. But, um, and then so Rick and Chris went back and they climbed Corner of Eden and that was the first route they did. Uh, it was, I think they graded at 15 M2, uh, it had about four aid moves up near the top. I think it's about 19 now, 19, 20 or something. So, um, and, uh, and that was the first route and uh, when uh, Chris came back, he, again he was sort of saying, oh, it's, you know, it's not very pleasant, it's, you know, it's really, you know, it's still the, these aid moves, there was still a, a sort of an, an idea that um, you know, it was it was going to be aided. It wasn't going to be uh, um, free climbing at all. So, so they kind of um, um, still there was a bit of enthusiasm, but a little bit more, but not quite as much as as it as it, as it gradually grew. And I I just um, checking to see the the next route they did was um, Liquid Life to Layback, and that was um, named because uh, Chris, who was prone to uh, partaking of the amber fluid, 
Um, <laughs> had, a, had a big night the night before, and Rick would arrive at, you know, duly at 10 to 6 in the morning, banging on the door, come on, where you go? we want to go climbing. And they sort of headed off down here, and uh, he had a big hangover, so half, halfway up Liquid Life to lay back, he, uh, he christened the climb, and um, you know, but he, fortunately he was second so it didn't really matter <laughs> but in those days as uh, Rick describes it liquid life to lay back now I think people probably jam it but um, uh, they actually lay back it because you didn't know how to, we didn't know how to jam we'd never jammed before you might have used the odd jam move in a, a route sort of on Trojan on Tipperagargan for example there's a couple of you know, finger locks you get in, in the groove up there but um, never done any sustained jamming so they lay back the thing and uh, which was you know, quite sort of uh, physical, <laughs> nothing else. So um, liquid laughter layback, so that was the, the, the next route they did, which the first one that didn't have any aid in it. And, and then gradually, week after, uh, I think Satan's Smokestack came the week after that. It was a, um, a bit of a, um, I don't know, Chris was sort of saying they didn't know what they'd expect. They climbed up and they got right inside the column. And it's just, as you, as you know, I'm sure many of you have done it. It's like a climbing up inside a pipe. Um, with not, not much pro, you know, they couldn't get much uh, when they first did it. And um, on the 7th of the December, it was the, I think the third, one, two, three, no, the fourth week, the fourth week that had been discovered, um, basically three people knew about it, um, Chris, Rick and myself. And Rick sort of said, don't tell anyone else. You know, we don't want anyone to know this is ours, you know, we're going to... Well, actually, he said, this is mine. <laughs> I'm going to develop this cliff. <laughs> and, uh, uh, well, Dave Reeve was led into the secret somehow. Well, I can't remember how Dave got into it. But on the 7th of December, um, Rick and Ted, Ca Ted Case was, uh, was told about it as well because we realised that Ted was, he was, you know, probably, um, you know, one of the, the, the strongest climbers around in those days. And, uh, like, Greg, Greg and Ted were sort of the leading the pack in terms of, you know, pushing the pushing the limits. Rick was up there, but I think um, Rick had uh, perhaps more persistence and more perseverance than, than the others, so he would often force his way through where technically Greg and Ted, I think, were better climbers, but Rick just had that incredible drive that he just forced himself through, he'd force himself to do something, and, and more often than not, he'd, he'd, he'd do it. But on that 7th of um, December, Ted and Rick climbed infinity, which was the first real jam route here at, at Grove. And that was, uh, I think, a turning point that, that particular time. They used a couple of aid moves in the first ascent and gradually they were, they were eliminated. But, uh, you know, to, to jam something like that um, for the first time was quite incredible. So that route, I think, uh, stuck in Rick's mind. He, you know, I think he always saw that as the, as the turning point um, in the development of Frog Buttress um, Infinity. On that same weekend, um, unfortunately, Dave and I, Dave decided he would climb a, a route called Devil's Dihedral. Well, he didn't climb, he didn't call it that until after, of course, but we started up this book corner and Dave in those days was pretty much into doing a bit of aid climbing and he, he, he just looked at it and said, oh, we're we'll, we'll just going to climb this as an aid route. We didn't even think about climbing it um, free and uh, he said, do you want to belay me? And I said, oh, okay, it's, you know, probably take a few hours. How hard can this be? and uh, turned out to be incredibly hard. Unfortunately, those days, Dave was extremely slow. He was probably, <laughs> he was probably the slowest climber I've ever climbed with. He was, he was just, inch, just infinitesimal uh, speed. He was making up this, and I think he got up the first pitch. It took the first day. It took a whole day to get up the first. He, he wanted to belay about halfway up, and Fortunately, I was on the ground for the first day, so that was okay. <laughs> but the second day, when I had to go up to the first hanging belay, the next day was was sitting in my harness for the whole day while Dave inched his way again, you know, so slowly up this. <laughs> oh, it was just horrendous, just horrendous. I just couldn't wait for it to finish. So, um, of course, you know, 1975 when um, um, Henry Barber uh, came to Frog. Uh, he ended up uh, eliminating what little aid was still in it, and it's, I think it's 20, grade 20 or something, so we wouldn't have been able to climb it anyway. So, <laughs> so I guess, you know, I, I think they should have changed the name because, uh, you know, the climb we did is totally different to the ones that people do now. But on the 14th, so the first, the first route that I did here was on the 14th of um, 
of uh, December when uh, Rick, Chris and I did Piranha and uh, that was uh, the first one that I did here. I sort of decided that I'd, I'd done my exams and end up failing half of the subjects anyway, so it was a waste <laughs> of time studying, but I, I should have been down here climbing. And then uh, they started putting up routes like, you know, Chunder Crack, Clockwork Orange Corner, Strawberry Alarm Clock, Orchid Alley, they were, they were on the, uh, just uh, Boxing Day, just after Christmas, those, those four were done. Um, around this time, just in the early 669, uh, Rick, Chris and uh, um, Greg and I, were, I was supposed to go, we were supposed to go to the Blue Mountains, we were going to go to the Blueies and spend a week there climbing and, you know, getting an idea of the greys just to see what the greys at Frog Buttress were like, how they compared and um, unfortunately just before we <laughs> left I, I damaged, I kicked my shin and, and I had a bit of a wound on there so I didn't really feel as I could climb so I didn't go but the three of them went and um, as uh, that's what they did down there is another story but when they were coming back and Greg was just reminding me of this just then um, as they were driving back past Frog Buttress back from Sydney you know there's this animated conversation going on. as soon as they got around Frog Buttress suddenly it went quiet and, and Rick and uh, Greg's asleep in the back seat he didn't know about Frog Buttress at that stage it's a big secret because Rick didn't want to tell him because he thought Rick thought that Greg had come and stuff doing the climbs and tried to take the aid out and you know embarrass him to so he could free <laughs> his route so he didn't want to tell him about it so the he said, I thought it was a bit funny lying in the back seat when suddenly they went quiet as while they drove past from <laughs> They're kind of laughing, making these jokes, you know, Greg doesn't know what's going on here. So, and, uh, so it was a little bit of, um, a little bit of uh, kind of, uh, what's the word, um, rivalry going on there. And uh, on the 26th of, um, of uh, January that year, I'd, I'd kind of recovered a bit and Ted and I came up here and we did uh, the nemesis, Ted uh, uh, lead that route. Um, and just about basically dragged me up and it was, uh, I was kind of struggling trying to get up to the lip and he said, how are you going? And I said, oh, look, I'm just, I'm having a bit of trouble here. And next thing, just, he was incredibly strong to him. Next thing he, he said, I'll give you a bit of tension. And he suddenly, I just found myself being winched up to the, <laughs> the, the lip, which was fantastic. So he said, oh yeah, this is not that hard, really. <laughs> so, uh, a bit of rope uh, um, uh, helped me up that one. Um, I guess other, other, uh, Gradually then the uh, Brisbane Rock Climbing Club was introduced to Frog and so people started to come and then uh, other, other routes started to appear but it was really still Rick and Chris uh, at that stage um, were climbing together. Um, I, I, Greg and I and a few others, we didn't particularly like climbing here because it, it was, you know, physically it's quite demanding some of them and um, so a lot of the climbs we found, found were quite strenuous. Um, I, I still prefer the walls and so we kind of um, ended up sort of heading back up to the glass houses and, and um, didn't, really, um, didn't really get into jamming as much as Rick and, and some of the others here at the time. But one significant route on the 21st of August was the first uh, route which, uh, led by women and that uh, Marilyn Dole and Pat uh, Prendergast, it was an all-female ascent. So that was uh, a climb called Revolution. They did that uh, the 24th of August 1968. So that was the first time that um, a, a woman had led a climb here, so a significant, um, a significant date that one. I mentioned Henry Barber, Henry Barber, Rick had met Henry in uh, Yosemite in 1973 when Rick climbed the nose, was the first Australian to climb the nose, actually our, our, our old mate in Sydney Keith Bell was second, Rick was supposed to climb with Keith but I think Keith missed a flight or something or other or plane was delayed and you know, Rick being typically Rick couldn't wait a day, so he's in Yosemite and he's chatting to this uh, English guy, happened to be Doug Scott, um, and um, he wanted to do the nose, so he said, I'll go and do it now. So, you know, poor old Keith arrives a day later and they're sort of halfway up the nose, so, <laughs> so Keith had to find somewhere else to climb. So he did the second Australian ascent the day after Rick. Um, but Henry, when Henry came here in 75, uh, he um, introduced uh, a couple of interesting things to Frog and to Australian climbing. Uh, one was chalk. Um, chalk had started to appear in Australia in Victoria. Chris Dewhurst had been climbing in the States and he brought uh, chalk back with him when he came back to Victoria, but it hadn't come to Queensland. And when Henry arrived here, um, he was an extraordinary climber. I only met him years later. I didn't meet him at the time, but Henry used chalk. Um, he also used very little um, gear. His rack was probably about 
um, a third the size of anyone else's. He'd just look at a client, work out, you know, what he needed, and he had such confidence. He would just, he didn't have a gear, he'd just keep climbing. And he had an ethic where if he couldn't uh, uh, get past the section, if he had to rest on a, on a bit of gear, have a rest, he'd lower down to the ground, pull the gear, pull the rope through, and climb up again. He wouldn't um, just hang dog, he just sort of, um, he wanted to do the route from the ground up. So he sort of introduced that really quite high standard. Um, he also introduced um, the idea of white cotton trousers. And uh, strangely enough, everybody yelled, a lot of the males up here started appearing in white cotton trousers a few months after Henry's visit. <laughs> but, uh, but when he, he was at the, he, he, he wanted to, to come to the buttress first in Australia. So he arrived in Brisbane and he was planning to spend, I think, um, a week here, but uh, there was a pilot strike on at the time and he couldn't get a flight to Sydney. He wanted to go to Sydney and then he was going to Melbourne. So he ended up spending a lot more time here than he'd planned and he ended up uh, eliminating the aid from, I think there was something like about tw 12 routes or something, maybe even more. Um, so the, while he was here, the first 20, grade 23 in Australia was done. It was the hardest climb in the country at the time, which was insomnia. He, um, when he uh, removed the aid from that, it was the first 23 in the country. Um, but uh, over these, over this, over this time too, other other people have started to come into the scene. But it's still very small. I mean, this number of climbers would never have been here. You know, we'd come climbing at Frog and be lucky if you saw one other person. And if and if you saw them, you'd either know them or you'd know them uh, a week later. You'd say, "Oh, who are you? Oh, you should come along to our, you know, the Brisbane Rock Climbing Club, which is only about twelve people anyway, I think, and that's not a very very small group." So it was very, very limited. Very few women, uh, Marilyn and uh, Pat Prendergast, Marilyn, Marion Spears, they were probably the three. There was um, uh, another couple of people, Leslie Rivers uh, uh, used to climb. She was a bushwalker who was a good climber too. Uh, um, and uh, a couple of others, but one, maybe one or two more, but that was it. It was all, uh, it was basically a male preserve and you know, these unreconstructed uh, 60s males were sort of, running the show, or they thought they were anyway. Um, but other people around that time, Ross Allen, um, he started climbing with Rick a lot. He, was, he's, he had a nickname, Cecil, we used to call him Cecil. Ian Cameron, Barry Overs, Steve Bell, Dave Carla, um, Ron Collett, and Ron, I think Ron's still climbing. Um, I don't think any of the others are. Ross, Ross disappeared mysteriously. Um, I don't know, we don't know what happened to Ross. I think he he went into a commune up in North Queensland and no one ever heard of him again, so not sure what happened to him. So I tried to track him down quite a bit. Um, other milestones here, I guess 1970 when Rick climbed Odin, that was um, you know, a really uh, imposing route at that time. Uh, there's a, some of you may have seen the movie that I posted up on, on, uh, on YouTube, of, um, Rod Bolton's movie, and um, it was uh, at the time Rick uh, used to love, he, he sent it down to all of the climbing clubs in Victoria and um, insisted, I think he went with it and you know, he gave a bit of a talk and when he played the movie he put on Deep Purple, Smoke on the Water, that was the, that was the soundtrack for Rick climbing Odin, he loved Deep Purple, it was, in fact on his mobile phone his ringtone was Smoke on the Water, <laughs> he just sort of blasting out to think, oh Rick's got a call, you know, so this was years later of course. But um, as an Owen, on the 20th of uh, June, 22nd of June, 2017, the magic block in Odin fell out. Um, and uh, a guy there was, um, Graham Payne, was quite seriously injured. He, he had seven fractures to his arm, pelvis, leg, when he was climbing after the guns of Navarone, which is next door. And he placed a couple of cams um, in, the, in the cracks that were holding this magic block. We always looked at them and said, how the hell is that thing sitting there? And of course, the answer was um, uh, not not by much. And, uh, it, luckily, it, it just missed his belayer. Uh, his belayer got a broken toe out of it. But he saw this block coming down. He said, "That's it. I'm dead," because he couldn't move. He was, you know, attached. And uh, so it was lucky that they escaped without without a death there. But um, um, and then uh, I guess other other uh, uh, milestones: Conquistador 21, the first grade 21 here. Although I should say that the first 21 in Australia was uh, climbed in 1966, you know, uh, seven years earlier. So it was, uh, uh, was it seven years, my, was my maths right? No, six, six, uh, six, five years earlier um, by John Eubank and 
it was um, so it was it took some years before people were able to to sort of I think Eubanks 21 to Janisex was a uh, uh, kind of a psychological barrier for a lot of people and Rick was determined to try to break through that here at the buttress and he, he was always insisting in um, letters and uh, articles that he wrote for Thrush, which was our national magazine, that um, you know Frog Buttress was the was you know the paradise, uh, paradise on earth. In fact, when um, Rick and Chris um, first uh, got to the cliff here and realised it was a climbing destination, um, the first name for Frog Buttress was called Paradise Lost. Um, that was the first name, and then uh, they they. Uh, um, I think they, they came up here. It was a local camping a parking area for, for people with, you know, um, they'd come up with their girlfriends or boyfriends, whoever they had. <laughs> and, and it was, uh, they were up here one morning and they, they saw all these used condoms, you know, lying on the ground around here. And Rick, Rick's nickname for them were frogs, you know, they'd all these frogs. And that's how frog buttress got <laughs> it's, it's, it's not nothing to do with you know, French. You know? It's the fact that they saw these, uh, these French letters, you know, <laughs> as they were called, lying around the ground. Oh, we'll call it frog buttress. Typical Rick, you know. So, so the name is, uh, is not quite as sort of you know, <laughs> <laughs> But other people uh, used to climb here around their 70s, 273. Ted. I mentioned Ted. I mean, Ted was uh, you know, an amazing climber. You know, so strong and very, very intense. Um, Ian Thomas or Humzu, his nickname. Uh, we're still good mates with uh, Ian. We, we, uh, Greg and Ian and I usually try to catch up. Um, post or pre-pandemic, we used to catch up. You know, in Tassie once a year and go for a walk and or go to Arapiles and, and do some easy climbing there. So he's in Tassie now. And in 1981, when the first bolt was placed at um, at Frog um, on uh, Yodel at the Valley by Joe Lynch and uh, Dave Denmark. They, um, I think Rick always saw that you know, right, right when he was sort of, uh, he, he died of cancer in 2004 and uh, he was really quite adamant that uh, he would have preferred to have seen Frog as a bolt free, you know, crag, just a, well, it's a classic sort of crag. But I guess, you know, the, the argument put up by Dave and Joe when I talked to them about this was that. You know, the only way to they they felt to push the grade on those routes that um, remained that didn't didn't have much prey was to put a bolt in. And even though Kim Carrigan and Rick, I think, repeated Yodel without the bolt, um, as they said, you know, you'd have to have someone with the same headspace as those to do it because they they didn't manage to get something in, you know, that was as good as the bolt around the bolt. So, um, and of course, it wasn't the first one. There's you know, there's bolts that sort of crept in, but. But Rick always sort of, uh, you know, right to his dying day, he sort of felt that, you know, the bolt, it would be nice to have a crag without any bolts in it. But uh, he, he didn't ever place a bolt that, uh, that, that quite a few others did. And, and um, subsequently, some people have removed them. But uh, it's one of those uh, debates, I think, that has been going on for about 40 years. <laughs> it's going to be resolved easily. Um, so, so the early days then were, you know, were quite uh, different, very different to now. I mean, we... We used to have a camp, uh, when you come up the road here, there's a gate across an old road. Well, that's where we used to drive straight up there. This, this wasn't here, of course. There were no toilets, nothing. Um, we drive straight ahead on that road and then it just ended. Uh, and uh, eventually, uh, you know, over the years, I think after about five years or so, someone dumped an old car seat there. And so we'd have a fire and sit, or sit on this car seat and sit around you know, a fire. And, you know, fire is one of those things where you put wood together and you light it. <laughs> <laughs> rare, rare thing these days. Um, but yeah, we had many camps. We used to sort of camp over in the trees there. And, um, had quite a few uh, memorable evenings there with you know, guitars and singing and um, the odd glass of uh, beer. And I remember uh, Marilyn once... Uh, Whacking Ted on the head with a bottle of beer, an empty bottle, fortunately. When I think he, I think he had one too many, and sort of uh, um, decided that um, he'd give Marilyn a hug, and she wasn't really. She sort of let him know that it wasn't on. So <laughs> <laughs> bottle of beer on the head sort of, sort of uh, made it clear. <laughs> but, um, this is uh, Greg's kept. This this is the second uh, guidebook that Rick produced in 1969, a frog oh. buttress. I think there are about 50 roots in here, but it's um. Just typed, he just typed it on his typewriter at home, um, roniated it off, cut the pages up, 
by hand and just stapled it together and uh, you know, sold it, I think it was a dollar or something, but um, <laughs> this is the second book. I think I had a, I've got a copy of the first one, um, which is, you know, got a few more, uh, this has got a few more roots in it, but, uh, but this was it. And uh, um, so very, very simple kind of uh, um, times, but as I said, you know, very few, uh, uh, very few women. It was very much a, a sort of male preserve. And I think it was probably in the late 60s where um, the word got around uh, down south and Rick was you know started writing about it uh, in Thrutch he was very much into pushing frog buttress as the you know this is the the, the center of the universe and because um, Chris Baxter in Victoria was saying no no Victoria is the center of the universe and so the two of them you know were at loggerheads for you know 20 years basically in the in the, um, the pages of Thrutch and in the end I think uh, Rick decided that uh, he'd had enough of these barbs and he just he refused to write uh, anything more I think in about was it 19 I think it was about the 19 1980s Rick just he, he got so sick of the, the constant sort of you know barrage of criticism from particularly Chris Baxter uh, and Victoria because we always always used to sort of have a go at the Victorian climbing club the Victorians and, and even the New South Wales the SRC uh, climbers would say you know, Queensland and New South Wales against Victoria because they didn't like Victoria either. <laughs> so, uh, Rapalese, I mean, it's an incredible place, of course, and if any of you have been there, you realise they had plenty, plenty to boast about, but it um, um, was probably just a little bit too much at times. But anyway, Rick didn't write anything for 20 years, and it was only, I think, in 1996 he, he uh, decided to write something for Rock Magazine, which Chris Baxter started, and Chris actually, uh, you know, they made friends and he said, you know, why don't you write something? And so Rick wrote us an article for that, which is still a good read. It's called The Glory Days. If it's, uh, I think it was in 96, in the 96 edition of Rock. But I've got a copy of it somewhere. If anyone wants it, I can send it to you. But uh, it's a good summary of, uh, of you know, the, the history of uh, climbing here. So Frog Buttress really was uh, a turning point, I think, in climbing in Australia, um, particularly, in, uh, certainly in Queensland. Um, it didn't mean that we weren't climbing anywhere else. I mean, Rick was still climbing in Maroon and, you know, climbs like Bo Brummel and all those uh, big routes down there, Phaedra and others. He was still, still liked the big faces. Um, he'd still go up and climb uh, in the glass houses occasionally, but really a frog buttress um, really was, became the centre of his attention and, and his, you know, obsession really for, um, until he was unable to climb here. It's interesting, every year on the... Uh, 17th of um, November, Chris and Rick, um, I think they started this in about uh, 90, what was it? maybe the mid 90s, they'd come back on the anniversary of climbing Corner of Eden and they'd do the route again. And uh, my brother was kind of, um, he hadn't been into climbing much, but he could still manage to get up it. He was still, you know, he's always quite strong. And he, if he wasn't on the grog the night before, which he probably, <laughs> he probably would have been. But, um, so uh, they did that up until the time my brother died in 91 and then uh, Rick was diagnosed with uh, um, an inclusion body myotisis which is a mitosis which is a kind of debilitating muscle muscle, muscle disease. Um, he still thinks he, he thought, I mean, he suspected that he might have got it, you know, climbing in the Himalayas. Um, not sure, you know, it could be hereditary. It's one of those kind of weird things like... Uh, um, um, some of those, you know, the muscle diseases, I don't know where they come from, but anyway, from about the early 90s, he was unable to climb, he just had to stop, and, and he started, the grazy got worse and worse, and uh, he was using a walking stick, and I think in um, 98, we had a um, uh, we had a, a reunion up here, and Rick was uh, here, and he insisted that he wanted to do one last, uh, one last go up the cliff at Frog Buttress, and he couldn't climb, so... He ended up um, abseiling down Infinity, which was his uh, favourite climb, and uh, it was kind of um, very touching to see him, you know, just struggle over to the top of the cliff, you know, basically lower himself down. His legs were so weak he couldn't really push and walk, but he just kind of slid down the side of Infinity, um, abseiling, and um, it was when he got to the bottom, we, we, we were, Greg was here, and we said, oh, we'll give you, you know, we'll will carry you up and he said no bugger off I'm, I'm, I'm going to get up myself and he basically crawled up you know on his hands and knees all the way from infinity up the scree back to the car park he refused to let anyone help him 
because his muscles were so, you know, so worn. So, uh, yeah, it was a place that was very special to, to his heart. And I guess those kinds of um, moments, you know, uh, when you see them in retrospect, maybe they mean a little bit more than they did at the time. But, um, yeah, just it was, so Frog Buttress has, has been a, a particular, a special place for a number of us, I think, for not just the reason that, you know, we, we were there in the early days. I guess we saw its development, but I guess it was it was caught up with um, uh, with relationships, and I think that's what climbing is about, really. It's you know we tick roots, and you know you want to do this, you want to do better and better, but ultimately it's about relationships. It's about you know who you're climbing with, not what you're climbing, and, and those are the last things that last. The climbs will be there forever. You know our relationships are transient, so I think it's important for us to you know make the most of it you know while we can, and just to see this kind of gathering I think is just you know wonderful I think it really reinforces the importance of camaraderie and support and um, you know it's good great to see some familiar faces I wasn't sure if I hadn't met Jacinda before we've <laughs> spoken um, or Teresa we've spoken um, um, you know via sort of uh, social media I've met Kyle before and Dave and Mary a couple of uh, familiar faces there from um, you know from a while ago so it's, it's really nice to to keep that contact so even though it's sort of stuff around on climbs these days, easy ones, and as I was saying uh, to, to Mary, I think we, uh, at my age, you know, when you do a, do, a, do the same climb over and over again, it doesn't matter because you kind of, you know, forget it, forget what you did anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like doing your first ascent. So, you know, and that's what climbing should be about. You know, you just do what you do, what you want to do, enjoy it, and, and you know, keep the connection. So. Thank you very much for inviting me. I, uh, it's just wonderful to see people here, and I'm sure we're going to have a fantastic uh, day for um, a couple of days for those who are staying. And uh, oh, I should say, uh, I, I do have a few copies of the book with me. If anyone would like a copy, uh, there's only uh, 24 left from the, from a print from the print run, and I won't be printing another hard copy. I'm going to be doing electronic ones, as I said earlier out in a couple of months so if you want to grab a, a copy I've got some in the back of the car there so I'd um, be happy to, to do that so thanks again for the invitation and enjoy the climbing stay safe <laughs>